Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. I hope you are doing well. I hope that you are wearing a mask when you're outside. I hope you're staying safe and taking care of those closest to you. As you uh, may have heard, my refrain in the beginning here is that taking care of each other is how we will will get through this. Uh, I am doing. I am doing well. I'm. If if, if anything, that's kind of an overstatement. I can definitely say I'm. I'm maintaining in the most positive way uh, possible. You know, the the sun is still going up. Uh, I am balancing th- that line that we talk about on this podcast a lot uh, between awesome and disaster is is being balanced fairly well. I am very excited uh, because my fiance and I were able to uh, get our marriage license. Um, oh, uh, I would say uh, uh, last week, maybe a couple weeks by the time you listen to this. So I may be able to actually get married this year despite the fact that my uh the my original wedding was uh uh postponed uh due to the uh pandemic but i'm fi- i'm i'm trying to find uh, the silver linings everywhere i i can uh, in the state of the world right now and for me that's one of them uh another great one is uh our episode today i'm very excited uh to share this uh this interview with you my guest today is uh chris amato who is uh the bass player for the uh, post-hardcore band Hidden in Plain View. Um, some of you might remember them uh, from their uh, drive through Records days. Um, they were, uh, I would say, I think they were one of the more like heavier, more atmospheric uh, bands on that label, um, who was primarily known for like bands like, uh, you know, Alistair uh, and Newfound Glory. So it was them and, and Finch, they were representing the heavy, si- the heavy side uh, for for drive through records catalog. And we had a spectacular conversation. I, as, as a, as a pop punk nerd and, and a drive through Necker records nerd, especially, I really in, enjoyed getting to talk with, uh, with Chris about, uh, the, his band's time on that label, uh, where he is, where the band is at now and some of the projects that he's working on and hearing about like, cause I romanticized, um, uh, the drive through records bands, like uh, particularly Al- Alistair and hidden in, and hidden in plain view and homegrown, because I kind of felt like I grew to know the, know those bands, not just through their music, but through those, uh, the drive through records, DVDs that came out. And we talk about this a little bit in the interview and maybe there's someone else out there who would know the answer to this question. One of the drive through records DVDs featured a band attempting some kind of pancake eating challenge at a diner. If you know who that is, or if your band was that, let me know because I cannot. Uh, that DVD is in storage somewhere, but I know it's. Uh, I know that that happened on one of them. So if you hear this, or Richard and Stephanie uh, from uh, Drive Through, if you hear this, let me know who that was. And also, I'd love to chat with you as well. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having such a great label with so many great bands and great music. And uh, this is a this is a, a big pop punk. Uh, nerdy kind of conversation lots of new jersey uh scene talk but i this is i i really enjoyed getting to chat with with chris this is a a fun one and i hope you guys enjoy this as well um as i'm sure you 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 might be tired of hearing me every say every week we are available wherever you get your podcast so if you know a friend who would enjoy this as well i want to know who you who you are so you can uh, let them know we're available wherever you get your podcasts and uh if you want to tweet to me i'm on twitter at comic will carry i'm on instagram at will carry two three uh if you're listening to the show now i would love to hear from you so thank you again guys uh for being here and uh let's go to my chat with chris amato bass player for hidden in plain view all right uh thank you chris i want to make sure i have your i can pronounce your last name correctly amato Yep, that's correct. Okay, good. That's like one of my, like in the before times when I was still uh, producing stand-up comedy, my biggest like fear was uh, butchering somebody's name on stage and then having their <laughs> entire set become about me. Well, dude, I mean, you had Chris Afalios last week, so I mean, that one's pretty easy right there to butcher, you know? Oh, yeah. I, 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 was, scouring, I was scouring YouTube and just like, okay, here's an interview interview with him. Afalios. Okay. Yeah, Got yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm always... Uh, very careful about this stuff, but I'm ex- I'm excited to to talk to you, man, because this is uh, part of my my new goal I've made for myself on this podcast is to right. interview anybody remotely connected with Drive Through Records in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Be- because um, 
and I'm not sure if this was uh, the case for you, like at the time when it was when it was happening, but like that label and the bands that were on it, like meant were was such a big part of like my I, my development as a music fan and as a musician. Right. Yeah. I mean, us too. Like we uh, when we started as a band in 2000. I mean, it'll be 20 years this year, and actually in a couple of weeks, we started in the beginning of August 2000. Um, and at that point, we were huge um, early drive through band fans. I mean, like, obviously, you hear a lot of influence of like Newfound Glory, yeah, um, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, we were compared to that a lot, especially in the early days. Um, so, that basically was a goal of ours to eventually sign to drive through, you know what I mean? So, um, it was it was a dream come true once, once it actually happened. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I remember, because I, I, I grew up in like a really rural part of, of Maryland. And mm-hmm. I, I I would go like, I would go through like, my record store was like Kmart or Walmart. This was even before uh, Target opened. Uh, right. And I always knew that like, if, if a CD had that, even if I didn't know the band, if I if a CD had that like yellow arrow with the red background, I knew I was probably going to like it. Yeah, I mean, it's insane how they were able to build almost like a cult in a way, like a following. You know, like it seemed like their fan base was almost willing to accept anything they put out. You know what I mean? Like you don't find that that often with small indie labels, you know? Oh, yeah, a- absolutely. That was the first time I remember like becoming aware and a fan of like a record label compared to just like bands or, or songs. That was the first time I was like, oh, OK, I like I, I dig a lot of the stuff and when I would like buy CDs and like, Oh, okay. So these bands are thanking all these other bands. I should probably go listen to them too. Like, yeah. Like the, the, the pre, uh, the pre streaming days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they kind of marketed it that way too. Cause I mean, if you remember the comps were a big thing for that label early on, you know yeah. what I mean? So they would group all those bands together on a comp that evolved into a stage of warp tour. I mean, that was right before we got signed. Unfortunately, that would have been a lot of fun to be a part of, but, um, mm-hmm they they had their own stage of warp tour which kind of grouped that as you know together as like almost like a cult following for that for the label as opposed to just individual bands um and then that evolved even more into like full tours you know we did you know the drive through uk tour mm-hmm. five or six times you know what i mean so you know i mean we were over in the uk like five or six times and we did that drive through tour there and it was it was big it did a lot you know we you know packed a lot of really great places over there so and that was basically because of the label's name, you know, which is pretty crazy, you know. Oh, one hundred percent. I I would admit, I would venture a guess that like you and and that tour sowed a lot of the seeds for all of the great pop punk that is happening in in the UK right now, like your like your Neck Deeps and uh, and uh, WSTR and all of those groups. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Like, I'm not, you know, I still listen to a lot of older stuff. To be honest with you, I'm not really on top of the newer stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I have listened to some neck deep and I'm pretty, I'm pretty impressed with it. Um, but like, I've, I've heard people talk about that, like how bands like us were, you know, kind of like an early influence for a lot of the stuff that's out now, which is kind of cool to hear, you know, cause I just, I should dive more into it to see like if I can hear those types of influences in these bands. But from what I'm told, it's, it seems like, you know, that early scene definitely had its impact now, you know? Absolutely. I can, I can, I'll send, I'll send you some stuff after this because I'm, I'm very much in that, uh, I'm always excited to find like, Oh, they're like, I, I'm, I make a conscious effort not to be like the, the old man shaking his fist at the cloud going, Oh, this doesn't sound like the punk (laughs) from 2002, but, uh, it's, it's out there and there's, there's so much great stuff. I'm like, and I'm, I want to get into this, uh, eventually because Japan has a lot of great bands also, but it's gotta be, right. it's gotta be kind of, kind of exciting to, to hear like, cause, cause, uh, coming from like, uh, and you grew up in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're, um, the, the core band, like the three of us, um, that are still in the band that were there since the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, Bob, Joe, myself, um, we grew up in North Jersey. So kind of like in the Morristown area. Um, okay. they're from further nor- uh, Northwest from me but uh we're basically like just within a half an hour of each other so we were at that point gotcha from like the the taylor ham section of new jersey exactly gotcha not the poor girl (laughs) (laughs) i understand completely my uh my my future brother-in-law he lives in in uh haddonfield which is i I guess considered more more south jersey so yeah that's more towards yeah so so more so morristown so so you like grew up in the like new york city metro metropolitan area and um, I'm, I'm curious, like, 
because I'm I'm 34, so I imagine you're we're I don't think we're too far off in in age. So growing up in New Jersey, I just have such a romanticization for the the New Jersey like punk and DIY scene. And I'm curious what your exposure to that initially was. Um, so early on, um, I would say probably 1998 or so, I started going to local punk shows mm-hmm. um, and, and seeing bands like Big Wig and Humble Beginnings and Lane Meyer Joystick, a lot of these like really local bands, but they seem like they were, you know, just drawing in crowds and doing pretty well. So mm-hmm. I mean, that instantly attracted me when I went to the, when I started going to those shows, I was instantly hooked into that. Um, so luckily we had a great scene here in Jersey back in the day. Uh-huh. Um, we had a lot of really good local bands um, and that actually went on to do some pretty great things. If not the band themselves, people who were in the, in those bands went on to form other bands and, and do some pretty great things. So um, yeah, I mean, we were very fortunate to have such a great scene out here and that's part of the reason why I think we were as successful as we were. Oh yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely. Like the, the sheer uh, intensity of, of passion uh, for, for New Jersey audiences I've found, because uh, I've seen, like, I'll, I'll go see a band, like, in Long Island, or I'll go see a band in, in New York, or I, maybe I saw them in, in Baltimore uh, when, I was, when I was younger. Uh, and then I'll go see that band uh, in New Jersey, like, and I'm specifically talking about the Starlin Ballroom, and right. that will be the craziest the crowd crowd reaction I've ever seen the band get like that, like New Jersey is just like, has such killer audiences I've found. Yeah. I mean, we always, we've, we've always had great shows here. I mean, I can't complain at all. Like, like you said, like when we would play New York, um, there's just a weird vibe. Like, I don't know what it is about the crowd, but they seem to kind of just be a little more subdued. Right. Um, I mean, I just remember specifically playing Irving Plaza in that place, not really, having great shows because I feel like the crowd doesn't really get into it as much as they do in Jersey. Like there's a lot more energy. It seems like, you know, with the shows that we played out here. Oh yeah. Um, I, I would agree with you. I, I, I play bass in a, in a band now and I've definitely gone to, I've gone to shows in like the Brooklyn scene. And I, I love, I love doing and going seeing bands in Brooklyn, but it's a lot of, a lot of arm folding and I'm just like, why is everyone just standing? Why are we not jumping or jumping around? This is not exactly, this is yeah. not the show culture that I grew up on. I will say though, I saw, um, uh, a couple months before the, the, the pandemic hit, I saw motion city soundtracks reunion tour at, at uh, Irving Plaza mm-hmm. and people went off. It might've been, it wasn't Irving, it was Webster hall and people went crazy, but it was cause we're all in our thirties now. It's like, can we, can we save the moshing for the last song? <laughs> um, but that was an incredible show. Yeah, um, that's one band I haven't seen in a long time. Like that, w- I would have liked to have seen them play that that reunion they were doing. Oh yeah, they um, they sounded great. Um, so coming up in and I'm so you start going to to punk shows in your in your teens. I'm curious, like, uh, who who was who were the bands you were seeing, like, and who was around during that time? Um, so like the local New Jersey scene, they were like pop punk bands. Like I said earlier, um, Big Wig was a big one. I mean, they would play basically every weekend. Um, Humble Beginnings is another big one that we used to see a lot. Um, there were no really, no bands that really, you know, got big, uh, maybe brand new, I guess early on, like mm-hmm. we, we would see, we play, we would play shows with them before they got big, uh-huh. um, early, early 2000s and all that. But um, yeah, I mean, it was mainly just local, you know, high school and early college years type bands, you know, kind of similar to what we were. Very, that's that's very cool. That is, um, for me at least, the same way I found high school theater very important for like uh, getting my my brain wiring and like as far as like collaboration and and creativity. Uh, starting like getting into to bands and live music for for me was the same. Like when when I grew up, there was like I think five uh, local bands. One of them is is still uh still around uh, a rap rock band called Hydrofix. But just seeing like people play playing on stage. Like right. my, my mind was just exploding. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. Just in most of the time there wasn't a stage, you know, it was just like uh-huh. a floor in a, and like a Knights of Columbus hall or like a VFW hall. And, you know, it just, you know, the most crude sound system you can imagine. But for some reason that vibe and that atmosphere is, can, it can be really inspirational. You know what I mean? Even more so than a stage and lights and everything else. So. 
Oh, I... it's just more it's just more pure. There's just more of like a raw feel to it. And I think that's what kind of attracted me and I probably would say everybody else in the band as well, you know. Uh-huh. So that was that was your like that was like your come to Jesus moment. It was like, I have found my th- I found my people. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. I mean, it became an addiction after a while, you know what I mean? And then it just became like let's just take it as far as we can, you know what I mean, and do as much as we can to take it as far as we can. And you know, we knew it was going to take a lot of work, but Mm -hmm. nothing nothing was really going to stop us at that point oh absolutely so was big wig your introduction introduction to uh to punk rock also um to the local new jersey punk rock scene yeah i would say they were um they have a cd called unmerry melodies um one of my friends gave it to me when i was younger and that was the first new jersey like local band that i've ever heard um like pop punk band um, but before that, I mean, I did like bands like Bouncing Souls and stuff like that, but they were starting to get a little bigger. You know what I mean? So it sure. wasn't really like that local at that point. Oh, yeah, totally. You kind of go through like different levels. I've, I've compared it on uh, I've, I've compared it before. Like when I first started drinking coffee, I would want just like the the sweetest, like most sugary whipped cream laden thing before eventually I got to like, you know, like really obscure pull, pull, pour over coffee that takes like half an hour to make. Uh, right. For yep. me, for me, punk rock was the same thing. You know, start start with Blink One Eighty Two, that leads you to Rancid, that yep. leads you to Minor, that'll eventually lead you to Black Flag, that'll eventually lead you to <laughs> Fugazi, that'll lead you to DOA, that, all that all the DC acronym bands. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say Fugazi because my actual like my first show ever. I, I grew up part time. Like part of the time when I was growing up was in Long Island, mm-hmm. and uh, the first show I ever went to, which actually probably had a big influence on me i was probably in seventh or eighth grade and i went and saw fugazi and that i mean that just blew me away that was just like a whole nother level you know what i mean because before that i think the only show i'd ever been to was like the beach boys when i was like six you know what i mean so sure, sure, yeah. it just like it was one of those things where my friends like i have an extra ticket you want to go and i was like all right so i went to that and it was just that i mean that was another one of those experiences like wow you know what i mean oh wow where, when and where did they play they played this place called the Pewak. it's a um it's a it's a venue used to be in Lindhurst, Long Island. It was like a big warehouse, mm-hmm. and I remember it was like they tried to keep their ticket prices really cheap. So I remember it was like six bucks or something like that. It was crazy. Yeah, but, um, yeah. So that was another one of those moments. But that was that wasn't the Jersey scene. That was that was back when I used to live in New York. No, yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Um, so so Hinden in Plainview uh, starts uh, from this from this DIY Jersey scene, and I'm I'm curious were you in, were you drawn to bass initially, or did that come later? Uh, I never played bass in my life um, in a band like like that. You know what I mean? It was mainly guitar. Like I'm still like to this day, I still have like you know a bigger guitar collection than I do bass collection. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was kind of like the need for a bass player, so I kind of just filled that need. Um, the way it kind of worked is, is my brother was in a band called face first and they would practice in the basement of my parents' house in, in, uh, Mendham, New Jersey. And, um, <clears throat> so I met their drummer who became the guitar singer of hidden plain view. And he was kind of expressing interest in starting another band on the side that, you know, he could showcase playing guitar and singing and all that stuff. Cause you kind of stuck on a drum set in that band. Uh-huh. Um, so uh, I got, I hooked up with him. He was in a band called, um, eight over par. He's like, I know this singer. Cause I don't really want to just sing. I want to play guitar and sing. Mm-hmm. So he, he, uh, he's like, I know this guy who can sing too. So it turned out to be his trumpet player who also sang with him in eight over par. And that's our singer, Joe. Mm-hmm. So he brought him over. And then, um, I had a guitar player that I was playing with at that time. So there was two guitar players at the, already with Bob and Kenny. And so for me, it was like, you know, what else am I going to do? I can't play drums. I don't sing. So I play bass. <laughs> right you know, it's, I, I think that story is pretty typical for a lot of bass players. Honestly, I think it's like, you know, the fill the, the fill the role part, you know what I mean? Like we, we need a bass player. So this guitar player is going to have to play bass now, you know? So, yeah, that's, that's how I'm playing bass in, in, in the band I'm in right now. I I've had, uh, I'd never, I had never played bass in a in a band before the band i'm in right now but yeah exactly you, you gotta you gotta fill the fill the need <laughs> exactly yeah i mean you gotta have the bass player you know <laughs> oh yeah ex- exactly and and especially because like i am very drawn to like the sound of a bass guitar that's why like i love 
like whenever I, I watch lots of like recording tutorials and stuff, cause that's been my like self-improvement project while I'm in quarantine. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I'm always very drawn to like being able to hear the bass. Like, like I like guitars with like a lot of mid range compared to like, uh, I guess more modern metal productions where it's like, you're supposed to feel the bass and not, right. uh, and not actually like you'll, you'll definitely hear if it's missing, but it's not, there's not a ton of attention drawn to it. Right. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, I mean, for me, it used to be about getting the biggest cabinet, you know what I mean? Like getting the best amp you can imagine, like all this other stuff. But mm -hmm. honestly, like over time, like I've started downsizing because you don't really need, if, you, if you're just running through a, you know, through a PA, you don't really need all that stuff. I mean, that, that stuff is good for you on stage to hear, but the audience isn't really hearing that. I mean, you know, a DI, like a, a Sanzan pedal works great for me because you can control the, the uh, you know, the tones and the sounds and how beefy things are and how much distortion you're adding to it and all that just directly on a pedal. And you don't even need an amp at that point. You can just go directly into the PA if you wanted to, you know? Yeah, that's uh, I, I've got a, a Sans amp and uh, I, I like being able to have that option as well. I use it uh, at home as well. It's just I go right from that to uh, a channel on the on my audio interface. And yeah, yeah that nice. li that little box is that little box is magic. It makes every bass sound infinitely better. Than it really they... does, man. It's crazy how awesome that thing is. I mean, I, I've known bands that have toured the country just using like a Sans amp, you know, like not even that, no bass amp or anything else like that. Oh yeah, I think Rush, uh, their last couple of tours, eventually, uh, Giddy Lee got to the point where he didn't have an he didn't have an amp at all. He would just go through the venue, and that's when he started like putting like washing machines and like rotisserie. Yeah, oh yeah, him. yeah. I've seen footage of that. <laughs> Uh, which I, I always uh, I, I always got a kick out of. Um, so hidden in so hidden in plain view start and I and you start uh, and I imagine you start uh, playing around r around locally, and then mm. and then your your first EP was on a on a local on a different label, right? Right. So that was um, we just it was something I started honestly. It was like DAB Records, like it was a, kind of a joke. It stood for Drunk and Broke. You know, I don't uh -huh. know. It was just one of those silly things at that point. But um, we weren't really like, I, I wasn't going to push anything with that. I just kind of wanted to like put that together just so we could like put a release out. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. that's basically what that was for. Everything was self-financed. We, uh, you know, pay for our studio time. I think we knocked out that record, I think within a weekend or so. I mean, that was pretty quick. Um, it was only, it was six songs. I think it was five songs was like a hidden track. And then um, we, we pressed a thousand, I think it came out to like a thousand 33 CDs or something like that. And mm -hmm. we only did one pressing. So gotcha. yeah, that was all, that was all DIY, but that's what our friends were doing. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. we, we'd get contacts from people like, Hey, this is a great pressing company. Use these guys or, you know, these people will do stickers. These people will do t-shirts. So it was kind of like local networking, you know, at that point. Oh yeah, totally. It was uh, it was, it was DIY business school. Um, yeah, I, I I tried to hunt hunt that stuff down to listen to because I think what always kind of drew, drew me, but I couldn't find any of it. I'm I'm curious. I think what always had has drawn me to to hidden in plain view. I I remember being uh, when I was younger, kind of erroneously putting you in the same category as like the used or poison the well or Atreyu. you, but I don't I, I I don't think that's exactly accurate because I think Joe always had like a more uh, like you have the like atmospheric like guitar sounds but you're never right. like metal or screamy no well i mean we kind of were at a certain point um it's funny you say that because like we try to forget about those days but i mean that was like a uh <laughs> i mean that was like the thing at that point you know what i mean like sure um early on the, the first the first ep we did find um that's definitely more pop punk like fast like you know fast drum beat kind of pop punk you know what i mean it's, it's sure, definitely yeah. not not labeled emo or screamo or whatever else hardcore and that stuff i mean I've, I've heard like post-punk and all that other stuff but that that's pretty much the kind of music we were playing then was the kind of music that our friends were playing around us like the local band so that was kind of like just straight up pop punk mm -hmm. um and then we kind of evolved into a mixture of pop punk with some screaming and then i, I think right around the time we did our first dv for drive through is when we had the most I guess you would say screaming on song at that point. I mean, those are our hardest songs, I think. Yeah, I would agree um, with that. You know, that first EP, that first five song EP, I think was our, you know, because we had like Belly Full of Kerosene and like Shaman's Witch is Magic. Those songs definitely have some like hardcore elements to them. But I think after a while, um, before Life and Dreaming, we started moving 
away from that. You know what I mean? Because that seemed to be what everybody was doing at that point, you know? Yeah, I, I kind of remember that time. And I, I remember lots of the... Uh, I, I definitely remember, I think I always felt you guys kind of stood out on the drive through Records roster. Not in like mm -hmm. a, a sore thumb kind of way. Like it always made sense th that you in the context of the other bands on drive through, but you're, right. you're different sounding. And I, mm -hmm. and that's what I also remember. Um, the other thing it's talking about, about drive through is I remember those, those DVDs, uh, that they put out as well. That would kind yep. of, um, and I don't know if this was you or another band, but is there, <clears throat> is there video of on one of those DVDs of you guys like attempting some kind of pancake eating challenge? Uh, I don't think that was us, but we, I think the footage that they have of us, is at a diner, so I mean, you might not be far off. I haven't watched those DVDs in a, DVDs in a while. I have them in a box somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I should I should break those out and check them out. I've I've seen. Um, I mean, we used to watch the first one a lot. To be honest with you, I mean, it's this is the you know before we got signed, we were the yeah, yeah. That label. So I mean, we would watch it. And we you know, they were very entertaining. And then once we were on one, we were like, wow, that's pretty cool. But um, yeah, I haven't I haven't really, really watched them in a while, but. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to find out which band that was. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure somebody will will listen to this and and correct me. And and I welcome it because uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I those those DVDs are are in like I think I still have like one of those like big 300 200 capacity like folders that I yep. used to drive around. Uh, I used to keep in my car and drive around with everywhere I went. <laughs> the, I think everybody had one of those. Yeah, the like the the pre iPod days, mm -hmm. um, and and how did uh, signing to to drive through come about? Uh, so I reached out to there were there were some ties to drive through like through my brother's band Face First, um, mm -hmm. and then later on there became even more ties to drive through from that band too because they evolved into Houston Calls. But um, oh, yeah. early on. Early on, Jared, their bass player, who you know was in Houston Calls as well, he had some close ties to to Richard, and you know we were pretty good friends with him. So we mm -hmm. uh, got and for we you know we just kind of like subtly started talking to Richard here and there, and then eventually I contacted him and was you know I checked to see if him and Stephanie could come see us play in New Jersey, just at a local um, rehearsal studio, mm -hmm. and he said he would. And we're like, all right, that's cool. We'll go. We'll, I mean, we'll go down to New Brunswick and and hopefully they show up. You know what I mean? So we had a new guitar player at that time, Mike, and it was he. I don't think he'd played any shows with us at this point. Like uh -huh. this is like, this is like his first, you know, hurrah with the band. So we all packed up, went down to New Brunswick, um, went to this re rehearsal studio, and we were waiting. I think they were late. So I was like, because the rest of the band didn't really like believe that I got him to come out. You know what I mean? They're like kind of mm -hmm. skeptical at that point. Sure. Um, so I was like, yeah, no, he'll be here. He'll, he'll be here. You know what I mean? Like, everybody's waiting. And we're just like, are you sure, man? I I don't know if he's going to show up or whatever. But they uh, they both showed up. <laughs> um, they came in. We went into this view. It was like one of the most awkward things ever because, you know, it's just Richard and Stephanie and us in this small room. And they're uh -huh. like, all right, just play some songs, you know, and like, all right, that's cool. So we started playing, uh, I think we played like five or six songs for them. And then we hung out, went to the diner, you know, everything was cool. And then um, that was that. Um, but then they contacted us. I think we gave them a CD. They didn't really listen to it. They finally listened to it at some point. Um, they contacted us when they were in Jersey again. They wanted to hang out. So we went and hung out with them again. Um, and then we just started like building a relationship with them. Like every time they were here, we would always hang out. So, um, yeah, I mean, it kind of evolved into that. And then they were going to start the side label Rushmore and they were considering signing us to that. But then mm -hmm. they decided, Hey, you know, we think you're going to be more like drive through material at that point. So that's when they decided to put us on drive through. So, yeah, that's, that's very cool. I, I, I don't know exactly like what happened, what happened to them after drive through kind of started to fade, but the everything I've read about them is that they're, atypical like very cool record label people like they seem like they're they're genuine yeah they're amazing i mean honestly like we would have not had the success we had without them you know what i mean and they were always awesome like there's a lot of different stories here and there with people you know like i i don't you know i don't know like i've heard negative things i've heard positive things this and that but it's like they've been amazing you know they're like they're fun to hang out with they're like really loyal everything's like a family you know what i mean like mm -hmm. when we were when we, we'd go out to california we'd stay at their house every single time we were on tour there i think we like came through the state like i don't know 20 times and like we tried to make it try to make it like um 
a thing where every time we came through, we would stay with them and just hang out with them and all that and all this stuff. Because some bands would just go to hotels and do their thing there, but you know, every time we were in the area, we tried to hang out and I don't know. It was just like it was it was it was very much like a family. You know what I mean? Like everybody was really mm-hmm. cool to each other. So, and that's what we liked the most about it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And and I I can say as as a fan of of your band and as a fan of that label that I think all came through. There was a great article about drive through in a uh, guitar world magazine. I remember reading and always thinking like those, that, that all seem, those all seem like a great group of, of humans. Um, and so, so you signed to drive through the first, this first EP comes out and then had you done any touring prior to this or is this after the, the EP comes out is this when you f- first start touring so we did a tour in 2002 that was set up by Jarrett who was in um face first in Houston calls and uh it was hidden in plain view with face first it was our first like DIY just get in like a you know rickety old van and just, like go and you know play the smallest shows in the middle of nowhere and, and like just hope that like you get five to ten dollars per show or something like that you know like it was like a summertime thing to do like just something fun to do yeah um so i mean we consider that our first tour but it wasn't really like a you know set up with a booking agent or anything like that but it did prepare us for a lot of the stuff we experienced when we started like you know hardcore touring so i mean that was a lot of fun it was almost like a summer vacation in a way like mm-hmm. we ended up we ended up getting to seattle we we stayed there for like seven days and played like five shows you know what i mean like it was that kind of thing you know what i mean like it was just kind of like land where you land and then just see what happens. Um, but we eventually, um, our van event- eventually broke down in like right outside of Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. So uh, we just left it <laughs> and like <laughs> the, our merch guy, our merch guy had a, uh, had an uncle there. So we parked our trailer with all our equipment there at his house in Vegas. And then we rented a car. Two of us flew home. We rented a car. We just drove all the way back to Jersey. Uh-huh. Got Joe, our singer's dad's truck, drove back. Uh, Bob and Joe drove all the way back to Vegas, picked up the trailer, then came home, and then uh, we started playing shows locally at that point again. So yeah, I mean that was a you know crazy experience. Thankfully, nothing like that ever happened again on tour. Oh yeah, I've heard uh, the the like horror stories of like van breakdowns. I'm guessing I, it sounds like it happened after after the show, which I guess is the silver lining of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of so, that I mean, of that story. But um, it's weird because it's funny because we were um, we were trying to get to to play LA because we were going to meet with this record label called Militia Group. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember them. It was from you know they're pretty. I don't know if they were that big, but um, so yeah, we were trying to get to LA to play a show for them, and and we were unable to because of the breakdown. So I mean, I guess that kind of saved us from getting signed to that and not being able to sign the drive through. You know, exactly. Every uh, that old saying, everything happens for a reason. Uh, yeah, rings rings true. Um, what is something, what is something, uh, about being in a band on tour that would surprise, uh, surprise most people? Cause I've, I've never really done like any hardcore touring like, like that. I would love to, but, uh, I'm, I'm curious what, what is something that surprised you when you started like really hitting the road hard? The downtime, I think. I mean, honestly, I think the downtime is what really does it. Like there's so much, like even to this day, I look back and say like, what, what was I doing like half the time? You know what I mean? Cause there's so much like time where you're not doing anything at all you know what i mean like mm-hmm. between you know the, the drives you're not doing anything you get out of the, you get out of the van you get to the venue you know unpack all the stuff you're sitting around for another five six hours you play for a half an hour to an hour and then that's it you know what i mean pack up get back in the van and go i mean there's just so much like there's so much sitting around and, and that kind of thing you know what i mean so Oh, that yeah. was the that was the thing that surprised me the most. Like I thought there would be more like sightseeing and like you know as we started touring more we would sightsee more. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, but uh, yeah, it just it seemed like there was a lot more downtime than I thought there would be. Yeah, that yeah that 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 makes uh, makes sense to me. And and just and don't tell me anything. And you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. But I'm I'm just curious from a outsider's perspective on the the music business. When you're like a, a band of of that level, when you're signed to a in indie label is that uh is that a point where you're like you have guaranteed income from each show or you just kind of is it dependent on still dependent on turnout at that point um i mean yeah you kind of it it varies i'm not really sure how that works 100 percent. honestly like um it helped a lot honestly like it obviously helped a lot you know what i mean like our guarantees you know we got better guarantees the, the more we uh 
you know, continue to tour and put records out on a, on that on that label. But mm-hmm. um, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know a hundred percent. Like, would determine the factor. What was what were the factors that determined like how much we were getting per show and that kind of thing? And you know, I mean, we weren't starving. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. we were doing fine. Like, it's an interesting question because you do wonder. You know, I, I, you know, you do wonder like how people are able to make it this and that, but, um, yeah, I mean, we were fine. It just, you know, it was comfortable. We had a comfortable living at that point. Well, excellent. Yeah. I remember, um, I didn't ask, uh, I didn't ask Tim this when, when, when we chatted, but I remember the, again, from one of those drive through DVDs, I guess they got screwed over by some club and like carved fuck this club into the bar. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, we, we, it's funny you mentioned them because like, we did, we probably played, I'd say 250 shows with those guys. Like, I mean, we were always on the road with those guys. So, um, yeah, we were in Reno one time and we got screwed over with those guys too. And like the promoter didn't want to pay us and they turned into a whole ordeal. It was, it was crazy. But, um, I mean, that, that happened a lot early on. Like when the shows were in smaller venues and they weren't really like fully organized, like there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Like yeah, I imagine of, so. a lot of shadiness. I mean, dude, and think about it, it's Reno, it's Reno too. I mean, that place is shady enough, you know. Like, <laughs> on top of that, you got these shady like club owners and this and that. So, oh yeah, I'm yeah. just imagining like tons of people chased out of Las Las Vegas for for certain reasons. Yeah, yeah. And and when you get confronted, when you're confronted with a situation like that, is that like uh, you're gonna you you'll deal with it down the road, or do you get to a point where you have to like threaten to beat the shit out of people? I mean, we have before. I mean, it's just a, you know. <laughs> that's our jerseyness in us. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to take any crap. So, but yeah, I mean, we've, we've definitely like had our run-ins with promoters, you know what I mean? And, and, and run-ins with people who have, you know, signed off guarantees and weren't able to pay it. So it's just part of the thing. Like, yeah, it's, you know, some of these people, like, you know, some of these promoters will, you know, put these shows on and, and, you know, they figure they'll be able to cover the costs with the, the turnout, but that's not always the case. I mean, you got to have right. at least some up front. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing we never did. We never really like got, you know, we probably should have gotten something up front at, at, a, at a certain point, but we kind of just, you know, gave them the benefit of the doubt and just settled up at the end of every night. So. Gotcha. I, I, I was just curious because it's like, it, it's, it's like the wild, wild west. Uh, some of the stories are here and especially mm-hmm. like, I hear these stories with, uh, with comic, with, with comics all the time. Like, Oh, don't, don't, don't play this. Don't play this club. I got, they, they screwed me or, and this is and this is on top of like having to navigate a literal minefield of of depraved moral depravity. <laughs> I know, yeah, it's insane. Like, I, I mean, I I feel terrible for like what's going on now because I just don't know how they're going to recover from any of this. You know what I mean? Like, I just it's going to take like a I don't, I don't even know how it's going to work. Like, like where do you begin? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I just I, I it just it sucks. It, it it sucks for like professional like full time touring musicians at this point. I, 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 I agree. I agree completely. Like so many, so many of my friends, like, and, and people I've talked to, like their friends are like in the service industry or again, their owners. Like, I think I read some statistic, like, like independent venues are, are like 67% could close. And this is even like when shows will be even able to safely happen, safely right. happen again. Um, I know, I, th- I think there are a couple of comedians that are doing like drive-in uh, tours and of course I don't know if you saw that article about the band Great White did a mm-hmm. did a show with no face masks or social distancing and this is like the second time uh, they have had a major incident I don't know if you remember yeah. that uh, that club yeah fire. I do remember that <laughs> I it, mean yeah it just I don't I don't know like how it's gonna work is like you know th- this it, it seems like people also are kind of like assuming this is, you know, just because it's nice out summertime, this and that, like everything is going to be back to normal. But I mean, it's just this virus is not going anywhere, you know, and, and you can't have groups of people like that and it, for the foreseeable future. Like, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's, it's so tough to determine, like, when everything will be safe again. And then at that point, is everything beyond repair, you know? Yeah, ex- exactly. It's going to be a very long I imagine a very long, slow, gradual. I think if anything, well, worst case scenario in my head, I imagine where we go back to like, uh, like all the metalcore bands in like 2005, we were all just playing in fields again. Mm -hmm. And and then eventually we, we can slowly get back to like 
a, a like maybe a pat a pavilion then we'll get uh venues with walls and it'll be a very very like slow thing and right and i'm i want to be optim i want to be opti- optimistic because if i if i'm not then i can just feel uh feel depressed <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, and like I'm not like a professional musician anymore. Like you know, I mm-hmm. have a I have a day job, so I've been fortunate enough to like still have that job. Like I I'm fortunate enough that I'm able to work from home, you know, and still make an income. My wife does the same thing; she works from home, and you know we're we're doing fine. But you know, I have a lot of friends who are still in the music industry who I see their stories on Facebook, like you know, selling different things that they do, like taking up new types of crafts, like this and that, and it just you know it seems like there's no real support system for them out there. You know what I mean? It's almost like they're, they've worked this hard their entire lives and now they're kind of just like left on their own without any sort of, you know, benefit or any sort of like, you know, I I know. And I'm fortunately I've, I'm seeing there's some people that are trying to like to, to help those uh, affected, but I, I am like you, I'm very for, I'm was very fortunate for my circumstances uh, professionally when this, uh, when this happened, uh, mm-hmm. and I just, you know, was able to get one cam cable, figure out zoom and I could still, could yeah, still talk exactly. to, to human beings. Um, I wanted to, to ask you, so, so you, you, you said you, you, you played the UK a bunch and, and, uh, I, I love, uh, I, I've, I've talked to like Matt Milligan from, from Wheatus and have heard great things about the UK crowds. Um, mm-hmm. did you guys, um, I, I'm curious, did, did Hidden Plainview ever like tour Japan? I, I saw. We did one quick little stint over there. Um, we played a festival called Independence D, and we basically we literally flew out of um, I think we flew out of Newark. Could have been JFK. I don't know. We flew. I think maybe it was JFK. We flew out of JFK on a Thursday night, mm-hmm. and we landed in Tokyo. We played the festival the next day. We played a um, club cyclone. I think they call it. Um, uh, somewhere in Japan, uh, somewhere inside Tokyo or somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, we played a show there with Punchline, and then we flew home the next day. So we were literally there for like four days. <laughs> it oh, was like oh, wow. it was it was the most crazy thing I think we've ever done. Like we we didn't have a chance to like really sightsee or do anything. You know what I mean? Like uh-huh. we, just, we landed and played two shows and then came home. Oh, so that's that, that was that was our real. Asian extent of touring. Uh huh. And and how are how are those shows? I'm always curious. They're uh, amazing. Like crowd, they're amazing. Crowd, oh yeah. yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. It was a little weird. We played. Um, we were told that the crowd really doesn't interact, like kind of with you at all. They they kind of just stand there, but that's kind of a sign of respect. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we were like, all right, so nobody's gonna move, nobody's gonna sing, nobody's gonna do anything. But it turned out that you know they actually did. It was like a, kind of like a punk hardcore metal festival. So. Mm-hmm. I think that type of crowd was there and uh, yeah, it was awesome. Like they, we had a great turnout, you know, it was shocking to see people, you know, who knew who we were from over there. You know, we were at the airport and uh, we were at HMV and there's like a, a hidden in plain view slash green day display. And we we're just like, Holy crap. Like it's <laughs> insane. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, a- <laughs> I've, I've, I've never even been here before. And this is like insanity, you know? That is so. that is super cool. Yeah, yeah, I like the music culture in in Japan is something I'm I'm really interested in. Like talking about uh talk about you you used to tour with with Alistair. That I love I love those those dudes. I still have I talked to Tim. I haven't gotten been able to get a hold of of Scotty yet. Um, uh-huh. But I think he lives there now, doesn't he? Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, I I don't I haven't really talked to him since the touring days. But from what I've mm-hmm. seen online, it looks like he was doing some stuff with the uh, Rivers from. Weezer, I guess some sort of like Japanese pop thing or whatever. But yeah, I mean, he was always like really into that stuff when we were tour with him. You know what I mean? Like, I think he knew like fluent Japanese and stuff like that. So yeah, I've tracked down some of his uh, solo stuff. He also plays in um, I uh, he plays bass in this band called Monoize that I think has uh, former members of uh, their uh, old uh, touring uh, companions, Ella Garden. Uh, mm-hmm. t- Tim turned me on to them. They, it's that's like a, a blast from the past. Like if if I was missing like drive through records era pop punk mono eyes are an excellent example of that style still that existing. Out. Yeah. I really, I really, really, uh, in, I, I really think, uh, you, you would dig that stuff. Um, so, so, uh, sorry for my, my digression. Uh, I, I talk about J- Japan a lot on this show. No, too. that's totally cool, man. <laughs> like, honestly, I wish I, w- I wish we were there longer. You know what I mean? Like 
that's one place I w- I've always I always wanted to go, and like we were there for literally four days. So I mean, we didn't get the full experience. I mean, there's a couple of YouTube videos you can you can watch and you know see how it was for us over there. But other than that, you know, absolutely, that was our experience. <laughs> there, I'm ho- I'm hopeful that you you get get a chance to to play there play there again because I th- I'd love to. Yeah, I did comedy uh, over over there and had a really fun time. I had like one show when. Uh, uh, my fiance and I went there a couple of years ago. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I'm, I also wanted to, to ask you because life and dreaming. I, I love that, that record, but I think that that's a, a spectacular album. I think I even like uh, the, the second album uh, resolution just a, a bit more. And I was doing a little bit of, of research about this. I know you guys broke up by the time it, it was released, but was this recorded in, in Baltimore? Yep. We recorded it with Brian McTurnan. Um, down in Baltimore, he had his own. Uh, I think it was like a relatively new studio that he built. Um, it was a an old warehouse, and um, he converted it to a studio downstairs. And then upstairs was like a kitchen and like a big bedroom for us to stay in. So we just literally stayed at the studio twenty four seven. So it was it was a pretty good experience, you know. Oh, that is, that's that's so cool. Those that's the kind of stuff I'm I'm. Th- that's the kind of stuff that has always been like very cool to me. Like when my band in high school, we got to record like a demo that took two weekends. I was just in in heaven the entire time. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm curious based on um, based on your your studio experiences between the the two the two full lengths and uh, your different producers. I'm curious, what is something you learned like as a either as a musician or as a, a songwriter uh, over the course of making those your two full lengths? Um. Hmm. Good question. Uh, I think during uh, the recording of Life and Dreaming, um, we were really excited at that point because that was our first full release on Drive Through. Mm-hmm. Um, so just that process of being able to live in California for a month. Um, you know, I walked on the beach from Marina Del Rey, where our apartment was, up to the studio in Santa Monica every day. Um, it just when we got to the studio. We did we did the record with um, Jim Wirt, and he did a lot of like um, early Incubus stuff and like Ubastank and stuff like that. So he was kind of like, you know, he's been around for a long time. So we learned mm-hmm. a lot of interesting things about how to go about recording through him. Like that was the first time we really had like a you know an actual pre production session where we would you know had five days to just hash like talk about the songs and talk about the parts and talk about the vocals and where they're going to go and this and that like we've never done anything like that before mm-hmm. um it was it, you know it was just it was a different experience than what we've been used to because in the past we kind of didn't really have a producer when we record we would kind of just kind of like produce it ourselves and have somebody record it sure um and so this was a lot more it was very interesting to learn actually how you know you, if you take your time you can actually sit down and like figure out the structure of each song. You, you put, you pay a lot more attention to different pieces of it when you have the kind of time and money, you know what I mean? So, sure. I, mean, I think that, that was a, that was a big learning experience for me. That was a whole other side of music I had never seen before. So. Gotcha. That's, that's, uh, that's very, very cool. That's something I, I am trying to apply to my band now is a little, a little bit more like thought on like, Oh, well, what if we try to like this? I, I, I had a, a problem in my first couple bands where I was like, uh, where I was kind of rigid and accepting other suggestions, but I'm a lot better about it, uh, about it now. And, um, yeah. and, and recording with Brian, because he's like, he, he he's like a, a, apparently like I, I, I had not heard his name before. I was aware of his like very influential punk bands he was in. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was, uh, recording with him like? Uh, it was great. I mean, he, he was, I mean, he was awesome. Like he, he had, he knew exactly what he was doing. Like, you know, we, we really didn't talk about old stories about, you know, bands that he's recorded and stuff like that. But I mean, as you've seen, he's got quite a track record, you know what I mean? And like, mm-hmm. he did a lot of the hot water music stuff, you know, yeah. he was doing at that time he was doing, um, I think he did a good amount of the census fail stuff. So I think they were in there actually right before we were. Um, and he was working on the loved ones at that point too, which is another really awesome record. Yeah. I mean, he, he was, he's a very laid back guy, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't really, we didn't, he was very just like, you know, get down to business and, and, and not really Mr. Storyteller, but, uh, you know, mm-hmm. he, he was a lot of fun though. I mean, he definitely like knows what he's doing. So 
That's that's awesome. Yeah, it was great. That's very cool. And 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 by the and and so just because I kind of wanted to, I kind of want to track the the end of the band through the re, re reunion. And I, mm-hmm. I I love I really enjoy I I really enjoyed uh, the newest the newest DP. And I think Rise is a perfect place uh, for you guys to be right now. I, I um, but I'm curious. Uh, so I'm curious, kind of like if you could take me through the time from when you recorded to the band uh, breaking up and then what uh, brought, what brought you back together? So we weren't really doing a lot of touring at that point. Um, Mm -hmm. I think we like half of us wanted to be on the road and like some of us didn't, you know what I mean? So I think that kind of caused a little bit of stress right there. Um, And also I think we kind of were starting to focus on other things outside of the band. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. Bob, Bob started doing his solo project. He had this thing called the pilot, which he, you know, wrote and recorded a lot of songs for, he was, he was like a, our primary songwriter and still is to this day. So a lot of the stuff that he, he writes is not specifically for us. You know what I mean? So he will sure. take something and, 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 and turn it into something solo. So he, he actually put out something recent called the bacon years. Um, it's like a solo project that he does because he owns his own studio. So it's, you know, easy for him to do. Right. Which is, it's really cool. But um, I think at that point, we just kind of like started growing apart. You know what I mean? There was no real like, there was no, I mean, there was definitely friction, but there was no um, like all out battle or anything like that. Nobody hated each other. I mean, Mm -hmm. there was definitely some sort of, we definitely needed a break from each other. So, I mean, we've been on the road for about four or five years together and we definitely needed a break. Um, So I think after, before the record came out, we broke up, we decided it it just, you know, it's just not working at that point. Sure. Um, you know, we had like band managers and booking agents and everybody else calling us saying, you know, you sure, you sure? You know, like, I think we were just beyond, we were done at that point. And we, I, we actually didn't talk to each other for a very long time. Like mm-hmm. most of us did. I, I stayed in contact with our old guitar player, Mike. Um, but I didn't talk to Bob and Joe or Spencer for probably, you know, three or four years, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then I just, we have it, we're, we have, we're, we have like mutual friends. So I guess some friends started, you know, one of my friends started talking to Joe and then Joe expressed interest in starting to talk to me again. And then I expressed interest in talking to this Bob again, you know what I mean? So we kind of just like got back together through a network of friends, you know what I mean? So we were uh-huh. kind of, we didn't really like just pick up the phone and call each other. We were just kind of like, you know, so-and-so would say, oh, you know, you should probably talk to Joe. Like, I think, you know, he wants to do something or you should talk to, you should talk to Bob. It's been a while, you know? So I finally met up with Joe at riot fest in Philadelphia mm-hmm. and I only hung out with him briefly, just had a beer or whatever. And then at that point I was just kind of like, wow, like I think we might be able to actually get back together and do something. You know what I mean? Like you got, it was kind of like a very optimistic conversation. You know, you kind of had to feel somebody out cause I haven't talked to him in a long time. Sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it, it just, it, it I remember that conversation being very optimistic and very positive. And I was like, wow, if we can make this a positive experience, we should definitely try to pursue it. So, and as I say, the rest is history, you know? Yeah, ab- absolutely, man. Um, no, I'm, I'm very familiar with that, that, that hard switch your brain makes when you, when you're just like, I, I, I'm done with my current circumstances. Something has to change. Please do not yeah. try to convince me, me otherwise. And then, uh, it, good it's good to it's good that you you guys all had like a a a support system to like bring you guys back together in a way where in a way where it doesn't feel like like a job like that's something i think about uh about music uh about music a lot especially like i don't think the phrase selling out really means what it you what it used to mean uh Mm -hmm. but but i always applied it to like doing something that you wouldn't want to do ordinarily because at at that point you'd should just have like a regular job i would imagine i I right i mean and that's the thing too is like when you start experiencing the kind of success that we started experiencing there's a lot more pressure and it is it does become kind of a job um when we first started it was just like a weekend thing to do in between college and school and hanging out and work and all that stuff so that was our mentality through the entire thing you know what i mean it was just something fun to do that we were you know we enjoy playing music on stage it definitely turned into a job at some point and that's probably where it all started to you know you know where we we started to butt heads at that point 
but that's i mean it's inevitable it's a it's a business you know it's an industry like uh, mm-hmm. just what's gonna that's what's gonna happen you know what i mean no yeah absolutely and and how did uh and and so when you guys uh came came back together um how did uh rise end up getting involved um i didn't i was i had no part of that um you know not because i didn't want to but <laughs> joe and bob were the ones who started talking to them and they they just expressed interest because it seems like they do a lot of one-offs for a lot of bands that were Mm -hmm. um you know that have gotten back together or i mean they seem like they have a pretty laid-back policy when it comes to releasing things so i mean we approached uh, bob bob and joe approached them i think joe actually approached them and uh they said that they wanted to just do like a an ep do like a thousand copies and we're like all right cool so it was pretty it you know you know shared royalties you know Uh it's is very like there's no like contract there's no nothing like that you know it was it was very just like laid back um kind of just like a test run i guess you know awesome just kind of feel us out see where we were see if we want to you know, put more stuff out or not you know uh-huh. uh do you guys want to put out more stuff eventually yeah we're definitely going to put some more stuff out um we, we continue to write we continue to talk every day so yeah i mean we're, we're definitely like in it in it for the long haul you know um, like I said earlier, this is our 20th year, so it'd be cool if we could try to get something out this year, you know? Oh yeah, that would be great. And, and congratulations on, on, on 20 years. Uh, something else I say a lot is eventually at a, at a certain point, like, you know, record, record deals are, are, are exciting, you know, late night TV spots are, are exciting, like releasing stuff, like continuing to, to do the thing that you love. That is the, that I think is an under celebrated part of, of being a, an artist. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was talking to somebody recently about that, and they were just like, I mean, they literally just said, it's so cool that you're able to still do what you do now. You know what I mean? Like, after all these years. And I'm like, it, I never really, it never really hit me. Because right now it's like a side thing. You know, I have other mm-hmm. things. that we, we all have other things we're working on. But, um, yeah, I never really, like, stepped back and, like, looked at it from that perspective of, like, wow, it's been, like, 20 years. And, like, you know, we're still doing it. We're still able to do it. And we still draw, you know, like we still have people interested in our band. Like it's, it's, in, it's insane to think about. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. To, to go back to those, those, those shows in, in Japan where like, how do you know me? Or like, like the shows in, in the UK, the UK, like to start from like the, the, ba- the New Jersey, like DIY scene and then go around the world like that is, is something to be celebrated. And that's always yeah. going to be very cool to me. Yeah. Um, what what other stuff are you working on right now? Um, so me, I'm a, I'm a full time web developer, so I'm building mm-hmm. websites for people. <laughs> and that's that's basically my full time uh, gig right now. But um, yeah, musically, um, there's a project we're working on. I'm not. It's it's I'm part of the project, but um, it's called um, Jersey Interchange. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a guy who has found a lot of these old pop punk bands from New Jersey. And he's uh-huh. having members from those bands come together and cover other band songs, like other pop punk band songs. So I'm recording a bass track for a song by a local band called High Strung pretty soon. Uh-huh. Um, and they had Heath. I don't know if you know Heath from uh, Census Fail and Midtown and all that. They yep. had him. Yeah, do I know a, Heath. A, he did a, a big wig song recently. So yeah, I mean, something. It's a cool little like local project that's going on that you can definitely check out. That's that's awesome. Is is that out yet? Because I would love to check that out. Yes, um, they have a there's a SoundCloud and they have about ten songs up at this point. My song is not done yet. I got to do the bass track this week. Um, so once that's done, they'll definitely post it. But you should follow it on Facebook. It's called Jersey Interchange. Jersey Interchange. Okay, camera. I'm writing yeah. that down d- down now. And just just a uh, also a, a little uh, just because I'm a nerd. Like what uh, what basses are you playing nowadays? Um, I have a Getty Lee Fender Jazz Bass. That that's my main bass at this point. Um, it's the Mexican one. It's not the American one. Mm-hmm. I've never I've never really invested in expensive basses because I destroy them on stage and I'm pretty uh, aggressive when it comes to playing. So yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I found that just Mexican basses are, are are you know my sweet my sweet spot, and I think they sound good, and you know they, you know they've they've never let me down. So. Yeah, oh. I mean P bases and jazz bases mainly. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of the same way. I've uh, every I've talked I talked about this with uh, with Chris as well, and a few people like Fender figured out the perfect electric bass guitar, and they have not had to improve on it ever 
ever since. Like yeah. every every time I try to play, I've tried to play like some. I've gone into music stores and like played some like really high end stingrays or yeah. other kinds of bass and like doesn't feel the same. Like my the the bass I play with right right now is is a just, just like you. I have a Mexican uh, candy apple red Fender jazz bass that mm-hmm. has been my my go to since I I got it in in college. I have a I also have uh, a Mark Hoppus uh, P bass, but that I don't take uh, that I'm afraid to because like my we practiced or we did practice in in Bushwick like I don't want to get jumped late at night <laughs> yeah no I hear you and lose a yeah. bass that's no longer being made <laughs> I mean I do like I said I mean I've tried so many different bases throughout my career and I've had like companies come to me you know what I mean like here try this bass try this bass and um yeah I had a Epiphone Thunderbird, I think it was called. I don't know. It, it was terrible. Like it just, it just didn't feel like the Fenders did. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, even some, of, even some of the Squires. Like there's some Squires out there that aren't that bad. You know, like the vintage modified ones. They're pretty good. You know. Yeah, I played one of the, like the '70s classic vibes because. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, classic vibes too. Yeah. Those yeah. Are good too. Yeah, and and I I really liked it because like Squire from like when I was in in high school to Squire now, two right. completely different companies like oh yeah they, they, absolutely they figured that they got their shit together and absolutely they make some very cool stuff i think they also made the the matt freeman signature which i also am having a hard time tracking down yeah i hear that's an actually a pretty good base like i've never played it but i hear it's, it's pretty well made for being a squire yeah i think uh, the basis for against me uh uh you used one of those for for a while hmm, wow that's crazy yeah it, it's just uh Again, it's to to me for and especially for the kind of music I'm interested in, and and I imagine for for hidden plain view stuff, it's like the perfect the perfect sound. It's just yeah, it's, oh yeah, it's spectacular. I mean, I've just I've gotten so accustomed to it. The only thing now is like when you do get older, like that jazz bass does get pretty heavy. You know what I mean? So like, mm-hmm. like it, it's nice to convert over to a P bass. I think you you lose a couple you lose a couple ounces on that. You know because you don't have that you know rounded tail on it. But yeah. No, totally. That's what I've always I've always played the I've always been a jazz bass guy. Yeah, same same here. One one thing, other thing, I was curious, and then I'll I'll, I'll let you go. This has been yeah. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I I really appreciate you taking time to talk to me today, Chris. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to uh, to new stuff. Um, you you mentioned the bounce the the bouncing souls. To me, they are like a legendary New New Jersey band. My other legendary New Jersey band from the punk scene is Lifetime. Did you ever mm-hmm. see them? Uh, yeah, I did see them with Bouncing Souls actually, and it, oh, I saw awesome. them at that um, that P, uh, location I told you about earlier, where I saw Fugazi Piwak. Uh-huh. Um, it was, I think it was like the mid '90s, and um, it was it was amazing. It was like a really late show. And it was on a school night. Uh huh. But um, yeah, I caught it was Lifetime, um, Bouncing Souls, and I forget the rest of the bands. But yeah, they were awesome. That that's that's spectacular. I I never got to see Kid Dynamite though. Like after Lifetime, I never got to see them play. Uh huh. But um, yeah, awesome. Um, one one more thing, I'm just curious of is there a is there a record that you really like that you think not enough people have heard uh, that I should go and listen to? Uh, I can't think of anything offhand. <laughs> oh, that's... you should have prepared you should have prepared me <laughs> oh i'm i'm so sorry well well mentioning no, a Jap- japanese bands i'll give you i'll give you a couple a couple more so so scott's yeah. band mono eyes i i really like mm-hmm. um other great pop punk bands in japan there's one called uh alternative medicine mm-hmm. and um another one called septilog that's great like late 90s early 2000s pop punk and uh my favorite band who just announced they were break they're breaking up last week is a, a band called the winking owl they're sort of like hmm. uh they're sort of like a like like post hard I, I want maybe they're sort of like between post hardcore and pop punk i i would describe right. them as as paramore with a more with a more intricate lead guitar oh nice yeah they put out an album last year called thank you love letter that is my favorite album of 2019 so it's really good I'm writing all this down. <laughs> awesome. I told Chris Vefelius about this. I talk about that that band all the all the time all the time on this show too. So they're a relatively new band then, huh? Yeah, they're, they were they're newer. Yeah, they're they're relatively new. All of my favorite like new bands uh are 
are from Japan, interestingly enough, after, uh, cause I'm just chasing like, you know, I got really into like man overboard and all of the, mm -hmm. the, and the story so far. And then finding out all the bands they toured with. Uh, and like, I think alternative medicine did a tour, did a song with state champs for their most recent album. Oh, nice. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of cool news, new stuff. I'll have to check some out, man. I, like I said earlier, like I need to, uh, I need to explore more of that stuff. Cause it'd be interesting just to hear like how that sound has evolved. You know what I mean? Cause uh, I listen to older stuff still, you know what I mean? Like I'm still like listening to like early November and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, the good, the good old days stuff, you know what I mean? So, Oh, wh 100%. Well, I will send you, uh, uh, with, with your permission, I will send you some playlists yeah, that I've, I've put together. And, uh, and absolutely, if you're ever in touch with any anybody from back in the day, I would love I would love to to chat with more, with more people. Sure, definitely, man. Well, this has been fun. This has been a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and I, I really appreciate uh, you talking to me. And this is this was a, a wonderful conversation. I, I'm I really enjoyed this, man. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much, man. All right, folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can listen to Hidden in Plain View's music everywhere uh, you get your music, including uh, their new uh, newest EP from uh, Rise Records. And also, I will have a link in the description if you guys want to check out uh, that Jersey Interchange project on SoundCloud that uh, Chris uh, was telling you about. Uh, I checked it out, and it is spectacular. Uh, if you are into any kind of pop punk, and especially if you uh, have a fondness for the New Jersey scene, I would definitely recommend checking that out. Um, so I'll have links to that in the description as well. Um, if you guys enjoyed this podcast and know someone who you think would be into this show as well, we are available wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. If you want to get a free month of Stitcher Premium, you can sign up with the promo code AWESOME in all caps, and that uh, is another way to help support the show. It will also get you a free month of what I think is the best uh, premium podcast uh, site deal out there, which gets you hundreds of hours of comedy albums, ad-free archives, uh, as well as uh, archives to and access to your favorite comedy podcasts, including my personal favorite, WTF with Mark Marin. You can get uh, a month off uh, for free with the promo code AWESOME. And um, again, if you listen to this and you want to reach out to me, I am on Twitter at ComicWillCarry, and I'm on Instagram as well, WillCarry23. And you can follow the podcast on Instagram as well, between Awesome and Disaster. And I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, if it feels like it's like it's strange times, and, and I feel like the phrase strange times is very much overused, uh, you're not alone, but I know that there is light on the other side of the state of the world at the moment. Uh, I hope it comes sooner rather than later. And uh, you l doing this show and, and listening to you guys uh, is part of what gets me through uh, day to day. So thank you guys uh, very much for being here. And uh, very soon I'll be able to say that I am a, a married man legally, uh, as as I said at the beginning. So uh, brighter days are are, are coming, uh, hopefully. And as always, as I've said on the show before, uh, wear a mask, Black Lives Matter, and take care of yourself. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here, and uh, I'll see you next time between awesome and disaster. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>